and welcome to another clinical skills session video. My name is Dr. James Gill and today we're going to go over one of the most fundamental parts of assessing a patient. We're going to look at the blood pressure taking and what is involved with that and why to do the blood pressure we need to have a stethoscope nearby. Now it is possible to do a blood pressure very easily with a standard blood pressure meter. You simply put it on the patient's arm, press a button and walk away. At the end of that we're going to get two numbers and that will be the tell us what's going on with the patient's blood pressure. However, by doing it in that way, whilst that is the way that it's commonly done, it doesn't let us understand what's going on with the patient internally and also it doesn't provide us with additional details that we can get when we do a classic um, blood pressure. Whilst we'll routinely hear people say, you know, pass me the blood pressure cuff or the BP cuff, the actual name for the device that we use to calculate a patient's blood pressure is one of my favourite words, that being the sphygmomanometer. And essentially, we are literally measuring the pressure. But the numbers that we find, that systolic and diastolic blood pressure numbers, they're measured in millimetres of mercury because this goes back to the old school classic sphygmomanometers where we had a reservoir of mercury that would be pushed up a column and we'd see how that column height compared to the blood pressure. But how do we know that simply increasing the pressure on a cuff relates to the amount of pressure that's actually seen in the blood vessels? Well, for that, we have to actually ask what is blood pressure? So when we take a patient's blood pressure, we get two numbers. We get a top number, a slash, and then a bottom number. The top number is the systolic blood pressure. The systolic, the top number, that's the force that's created when the heart contracts and forces blood into the blood vessel. When it does so, the blood is going to put pressure on the arterial wall, keeping it open. This is like the pressure that's required to blow up a balloon. So we could perhaps change our unit of measurement from millimetres of mercury, for when we're blowing up a balloon, the number of breaths. So let's assume that it's going to take 120 breaths to blow up the balloon. That's our systolic. It's the amount of pressure that is keeping the balloon open. We then have the diastolic pressure. This is the bottom number. The diastolic pressure is the force exerted by the blood vessels on the blood, so when the heart is relaxed between each beat. So going back to our balloon scenario, it would be how many breaths are left in the balloon if we were to let it deflate on its own. So we have our systolic and our diastolic. The systolic being the pressure when the heart is beating versus the diastolic, the pressure when the heart is relaxed. Okay, so we've got the two numbers, we understand what that means. But what's it matter? So if we think about a boiler at home, we haven't serviced it and there's too much pressure, then we're going to get leaking radiators and the system is just going to fall apart on us. The same is true with blood pressure. So our normal blood pressure is given in ranges. So normal is considered to be 90 over 60 for the bottom end of normal, with the top end of normal being 120 over 80. We've then got intermediate blood pressure before we become hypertensive. We've got high blood pressure if a patient's blood pressure is over 140 over 90. If we were found to have high blood pressure, then that puts a patient at risk of serious medical problems. Because blood pressure affects the entire body, it's not surprising that pathological problems arising from high blood pressure can be seen everywhere. We can have problems with strokes, we can get problems with the eyes, we can have heart attacks, we can have heart failure, we can have problems with the kidneys, a vast range of medical problems from hypertension. Conversely, low blood pressure or hypotension is also problematic because like a balloon, or perhaps in this case a balloon animal, we don't have enough pressure to keep the, uh, the body upright anymore. So the balloon will collapse and 
so will actually a patient. I'm sure that everyone will have had the experience. On a very hot day, you perhaps haven't drunk enough, and you stand up and your vision goes a bit fuzzy. You feel a bit lightheaded. That's probably hypotension because you've stood up and your body hasn't reacted to the change fast enough and your blood pressure has gone lower than your brain would probably like it and is objecting ever so slightly. So, as mentioned, we're going to use a sphygma manometer in order to calculate a patient's blood pressure, but where does the stethoscope come into that? If we think about a blood vessel as a long tube, blood's going to run down it, so we'll get nice laminar flow, and there's nothing going to interrupt that flow. So, if anything, we're going to get nice, smooth-sounding um, blood flow. However, if we compress that blood vessel, then some of that blood is going to bang into this new dint that we've got in the pipe. So we're going to get turbulent flow, non-laminar, with every pump of the heart. And that's what happens when we take the blood pressure. So we're going to put the blood pressure cuff of the sphygmomanometer on the patient's arm, and we're going to get the blood pressure from the brachial artery. As we compress around that artery, we create the dint in the artery, causing turbulent flow that we can hear through the stethoscope. As we increase the pressure further, eventually we'll actually occlude the artery completely, and this will stop the sounds we're hearing at the stethoscope. As we increase the pressure at the brachial artery, eventually the pressure of the cuff will be greater than the systolic blood pressure and we will lose the pulse at the radius. At this point we know the blood pressure cuff has exceeded the systolic blood pressure and that's the start of our calculation of the blood pressure. At this point we'll get to take our stethoscope and we'll listen over the brachial artery as we slowly release the pressure as the pressure on the cuff becomes below the systolic blood pressure, the artery will begin to open up again and we'll start to get turbulent blood flow. We'll hear this noise. As the pressure on the cuff gets further reduced, the vessel will reopen to the diastolic blood pressure. When we get to the diastolic blood pressure, we'll now go back to having laminar flow, so we'll get very or no sound listening with the stethoscope. And at that point, we'll check the pressure on the sphygmomanometer, and that will show us what the patient's diastolic blood pressure is. So to recap that, the systolic blood pressure is when we are no longer hearing any arterial blood sounds, and the systolic is... So to recap on that, the systolic blood pressure is just after we've stopped hearing any um, sounds. These sounds are called the Korotov noises and the systolic blood pressure is present at the Korotov 1, so when we go from turbulent blood flow to silence, and the diastolic blood pressure is where we're at Korotov 5, so that's where we've gone from slightly turbulent blood flow to silence yet again as the pressure is released. Crucially, when doing a blood pressure, we must ensure that the patient's arm is level with the heart, because that will ensure that we have adequate pressure. For every seven centimetres the arm is elevated above the heart, the blood pressure will increase by five millimetres of mercury. So you can have quite a profound effect on a patient's blood pressure by not doing the assessment correctly. Similarly, the blood pressure must be checked on both arms and the lowest reading of those two arms taken as the patient's true blood pressure. With that in mind, let's have a demonstration now with one of the students as to how we'd actually go about taking that blood pressure. 